you turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1. As we continue our story, which is really the Savior saga, and when you look at the Gospel of Luke, it presents Christ as Savior, and it really is the story of Jesus as Savior, very unique from Matthew's Gospel, John's Gospel, and also from Mark's Gospel, and then it really delves into the story of the Savior. Now imagine we've journeyed thus far, we've finally reached verse 39 here in this very long first chapter. Mary has had this visitation, she understands that she is with child, she's surrendered to the will of the Lord, but how do you get this crazy, insane news out to your family? What do you say when people come to you and say, you and Joseph are betrothed, You're, you haven't actually been married yet, and doesn't Deuteronomy chapter 22 say we need to take you out and stone you and Joseph? You see, Mary, I believe, would have been a great candidate for those things which you and I go through on a fairly regular basis, and that would be a crisis of faith. She's about to make a journey to her cousin's house, to Elizabeth's house, that's about 35 miles away. I remind you, they didn't have public transit, they didn't own cars, didn't have cell phones, couldn't text, couldn't call Uber or Lyft. She was going to make this journey on foot. She's now six months pregnant. What's she going to say? Sure. You know, you didn't sleep with somebody, Joseph, or somebody else. Yeah, right. Holy Spirit. That's a good one, Mary. Mary's going to need some counsel. She's going to need some help. She's not going to need criticism. She's going to need for the Lord to speak into her life. And so part two of the Savior's saga, we'll pick up in verse 39 And take down through verse 55. Would you join me? Let's pray as we get instructed from the word today. Father, thank you. Lord, thank you for this incredible picture of this young woman, likely still a teenager, who has some questions about what's going on in her life. And you provide her with the comfort she needs, the counsel she needs, the companionship she needs. Lord, you know what we have need of before we know what we have need of. And we thank you that you provide that for us. Pray that you would just speak to us this morning. Lord, encourage. I pray if there's someone today, Lord, here in this house, Lord, watching online, that needs to have their faith encouraged. They need a word of comfort from you. God, would you give it through the life of this amazing woman, Mary, in Jesus' name, amen. Mary needs some counsel. She needs to talk to somebody about this. She she can't keep it quiet forever, amen? I'm pretty sure she's not going to be able to wander around Nazareth and everybody's going to go, well, man, you know, did you eat too much mutton this week or what? What's going on? Verse 39, And now Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. Mary's now alone. It doesn't say that her husband has accompanied her. You might notice that. It appears that she made this journey. We're not sure with who. She may have even gone on her own. She has this crisis in the midst of this. I I, I would think, I I know were I in that situation to where I've had this visitation, I understand that something is different in my life, something that no one has ever experienced. But I'm telling you, she's not going to Barnes & Noble and finding a book called What to Do While Expecting the Messiah. (laughs) Nobody's ever been in this place before. 
and nobody ever will be in this place again. And I'm sure she had some questions. What's she going to say? You see, here's the central truth in this. Just because this incredible event is about to happen in her life, she's going to give birth by the Holy Spirit to the Christ child, the one promised by the prophets, the one that the prophet Isaiah spoke would come, that we sang about already this morning there in Isaiah chapter 9. The child who was born, that's Mary's part, and the son who was given, that's God's part, and the government of the entire world would be on his shoulders, and of his kingdom there would be no end. And he would be the wonderful counselor, mighty God, the father of eternity. And of the end of his kingdom, there would be no end. That's the baby that's inside of Mary. I think she's got a couple of questions. She's probably trying to figure all this out. But you know what's unique in all of this? The world didn't stop rolling. Her her life didn't all of a sudden come to this like holy place of reflection. We don't find her sequestered away from all humanity. This doesn't happen in secret. It happens very publicly. Mary still had to go get water that day. Mary still had to prepare food that day. Mary still had to walk that day. She wasn't floating around Judea two feet off the ground because she was now bearing the Christ child. She was dirty and hungry and tired. Work still had to be done in her home and also in Elizabeth's home. Can I tell you that the voices of her neighbors weren't silenced miraculously that day? They could see what was going on. They understood. They still knew this is a Jewish community. She's going to visit a priest who serves in the temple, whose job it is to convey what we would call the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, including the book of Deuteronomy, she's going to visit a guy whose job it is to convey that truth to people. He absolutely understood what chapter 22 said. And it didn't matter if you read that passage later, it didn't matter whether you were married or betrothed. It says both. That the penalty for having a child out of wedlock then was take both of them out and stone them. This was a serious deal. The neighbors are going, did you see Mary? Yeah, she and Joseph, are, they're betrothed, they're not married yet. They weren't going to stop gossiping. You see, the world was still rolling just like it is in your life. When God comes into our lives, he doesn't stop everything else from going on. Amen? He he doesn't stop sickness. He doesn't stop what's going on with your children. He doesn't stop your financial obligations. He doesn't instantaneously take care of everything in your life. Your life keeps going. You still have bills to pay. You still have to put up with traffic. In Jesus' name, don't drive down Crenshaw. (laughs) Big mistake. I went to get Christmas lights because I'm trying to be more green. Connie told me I need to be more socially conscious this way. We can no longer have those bulbs that, you know, the neighbors can read from the light from our house. We're switching over to LED. It's Christmas time. Of course, everybody will be happy and joyful. Not. 
it took 35 minutes to go from Sky Park to Pennsylvania. You can throw a rock that far if you've got a good arm. The world doesn't stop. It keeps going. It doesn't stop for me as a pastor. It doesn't stop for you either. And it didn't stop for Mary. As she's traveling the roads, the robbers were still there. As she's walking, her very thin leather sandals still hurt her feet when she stepped on rocks. Mary's life kept moving. Part of the beauty of this picture is that she's now going to this place that no one in their right mind would actually choose to go if you were with child and didn't have a really good explanation like, it's my husband and I. You see, God allowed all these things. And now she's going to end up in the home of Zacharias with her cousin Elizabeth. What did Mary need in that moment? As you pick up there in verse 41, notice what it says. And this is the confirmation, and it's also the beginning of a hymn. A really good Christmas hymn, I might add. Notice the confirmation that Mary needed and received. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And then she spoke out in a loud voice and said, blessed are you among women. Not blessed are you above women, blessed are you among women. Notice that. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. Yeah, the Messiah, the King of Kings. But why is this granted to me? She's so excited. She's like, why do I get to do this? That the mother of my Lord, now notice what she's saying. She fully understands that the baby that Mary is carrying is the Lord. The mother of my Lord should come to me. For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, this is still... Elizabeth speaking, the babe leapt in my womb for joy. There was consciousness of that child that was not yet born. And if this doesn't settle a, an issue for you about the sanctity of life and when it begins, it should. That baby was conscious of the voice of Mary before it was in this world physically. It's the very same thing that Exodus 21, Psalm 139 declared to us. That, that baby that was about to be born leapt for joy. Blessed is she who believed. For there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told to her from the Lord. Man, did she need to hear that. Can I tell you the Lord knows what you need to hear too? The Lord knows what needs to be spoken into your life. But those things where you're on that journey and you're not quite sure where it's all leading. Now Mary was certainly blessed, amen? I mean, I'm pretty sure nobody else was running around, yeah, well, the Messiah is my son. I'm pretty sure she lived out her whole life and and did have some special treatment. Aren't you the mother of Jesus? So she was blessed. No one else could claim what she claimed. She had a very unique place. But Mary is also going to declare very shortly that Jesus was her Savior as well. Elizabeth already knew it. Mary's about to declare it. And so she is blessed in that sense among all the rest of the women who have ever lived on this planet. Blessed. 
But that baby had a life of its own. In an instant, there's this miraculous sign. Elizabeth filled with the Holy Spirit, and all of a sudden, John the Baptist, think of who she's carrying. The prophet Isaiah had the unique opportunity to speak of both of these children. Speaks of John the Baptist in Isaiah chapter 40 as the voice of one crying in the wilderness makes straight the way of the Lord. Amen? But he says that after he's already declared there would be one who would be born who is the seed of the woman. That would be miraculous. He's already declared what we already sang in chapter 9 of the book of Isaiah. The father of eternity, the savior. And so these two ladies are sitting there, you can imagine them, having a conversation about the book of Isaiah. Wow. They both needed some confirmation. They both got some confirmation. Because Elizabeth was going to be the mother of John the Baptist. The guy who's standing in the River Jordan who eventually looks at Jesus and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This was miraculous. They couldn't fully explain it. But the Messiah was conceived miraculously and revealed miraculously. The whole thing was inspired by a work of the Holy Spirit. As these things begin to come out of their lips, countless millions of other mothers would be able to say, well, I'm not the mom of the Messiah. That's just Mary. She had that privilege. And she would have to bear the burden of that as well. But that happiness in these two ladies was real. It was legitimate. And so they, they recognized that something not of this earth was going on. This is a work of the Holy Spirit. Mary is about to begin what I think is one of the most beautiful Christmas songs in all of the Bible. Sometimes it's called the Magnificat. It's this declaration of, of Mary. She is about to sing of the glories of what's going on in her life. Notice verse 46. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. Now Elizabeth just told her what's going on. And he's regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. That would be herself. And behold, henceforth and in all generations, they will call me blessed, and we surely do. When you get to heaven, there's only going to be one mother of Jesus there. Amen? Walk around. Can you imagine talking to Mary? What was it like to stand at the, the cross? How was it to raise God incarnate in human flesh? You ever wondered if Jesus messed with any of his powers as God while he was a kid? It's one of those little weird things I thought about. You know, it's like, because he was never less than God. Can you imagine a 12-year-old with those powers? Now we know he acted as God and didn't reveal himself. But Mary knew who he was. Mary knew who he was. Can you imagine what she's waiting for as she knows that is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords that's out there playing with the other kids? Yeah, she was blessed among women, to be sure. And she begins to just sing about it. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. You see, the first thing we see is what God did for Mary. And this is such a beautiful picture of how God still works in this world. He works in your life and my life and all lives personally. God was at work in Mary's life. 
And so this song, as you might imagine, there's a lot of personal influence that you can see in it. Her words, she's saying, this is my Lord. This is my Savior. It was a miracle of God, but it was still the Lord. And it's interesting because what she says, she's actually speaking forth the word of God. Now, we just encourage you, again, to read through the entire Bible in a year. The reason we do that is the word of God is life, it is truth, it is powerful, it tears down the strongholds of the enemy. The word of God is an internal resource that can be drawn on by the Holy Spirit if you have the word of God in you. And so Mary is able to speak forth the word of God because she has the word of God hidden in her heart. So the reason that these quotations, especially from 1 Samuel, come into play is she's already hidden the word in her heart. She's already read through the Psalms. My soul magnifies the Lord. That comes from David. She's speaking forth with that which is already inside of her. I want you to notice something. She's not saying, you know, I'm the the co-redemptrix. She's not saying, I'm going to be part of this plan of salvation. She's saying, my Lord, my Savior, my God. She's identifying with the rest of us. But she's also saying that that same God spoke to me personally. That same God worked in my life personally. That same, Jesus was Mary's Savior. Now, if you have a history of worshiping Mary, Mary's the one that said, Jesus is my Savior. So she couldn't possibly be Savior as well, or co-Savior. She just simply honored who Christ is, her own son. Now, I don't know how rough that would be for some of you ladies to call your son Lord, but I'm pretty sure that'd be hard. That'd be difficult, and it would only be real if it was true. Amen? You see, God always works this way. Paul, as he's writing to the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, it says there, put your own name in front of this, this statement, for you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh and not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty, and the base things of the world, the things which are despised, God has chosen the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are. God chose to use a carpenter's wife from a little tiny village north of Jerusalem, a nobody from nowhere with nothing to bear the Savior. And he's doing the same in your life. Now, you're not going to be bearing the Savior. We only need one. But he's using you in like manner to show the world who Christ is. He's using you to do extraordinary things. The question is, have you hidden in your heart the word of God? Are you magnifying the Lord with your life because he wants to magnify himself through you? The world needs to know Jesus. And the chief way they're going to know that is by watching you and talking to you and listening to your story of how God has been faithful in your life. You see, you could actually sing this song too. Great things he has done in my life, amen? We can all sing this song with Mary. Why? Because it's personal. 
It's absolutely personal. It was Mary's personal proclamation. Mary is going to be saved the same way you and I are saved. Her salvation is going to hang on the life of her own son. That's why she says, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in my God, my Savior. Completely personal. The second thing that we see here is this practical proclamation that's for everybody, everywhere, at all times. Notice verse 50. For his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm and scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Exactly what Paul conveyed to the church. God is bigger than all of our problems. He's put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He's filled hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. As you know, God cares about the hungry. God cares about the hopeless. God cares about the hunger, the humble. He cares about the poor. God cares about what the things which we seem to look at the world and think nobody cares. I can tell you there are a lot of people on this planet who do not care about the hungry. They don't care about the poor. But Jesus does. And so he makes a promise really to us. He says, Jeff, I've been merciful to you. Would you be merciful to others? I've been gracious to you. Would you be gracious to others? I have forgiven you. Would you forgive others? I've been kind to you. Would you be kind to others? I never expressed myself in glory. I've been humble to you. Would you be humble to others? You see how it works? Kind of we're sitting... Again, I have no idea why I have this thing of thinking that if I drive down Crenshaw, it'll get better. But we went down, because it's now open again, down down to have breakfast at Hoff's Hut. And I got my usual chicken fried steak. Yes, it's a sin, but just go with me. (laughs) Somebody said, you had that again. Yeah, it's really good, too. But I'm sitting there, and we got one of the tables that's along the glass in the new part that they kind of rebuilt. And Connie was looking at me. She could tell something was bothering me and I almost started crying. And here's what happened. I was watching all that traffic go both directions. And all of a sudden the Lord just impressed upon me. He says, you know, a lot of those people are lost. They don't have hope. They they don't know me. What are you doing about it? You see, God's been merciful to us. Mercy simply means he hasn't given us what we've earned. You know, I think at Christmas time it does us some real good to remind ourselves we don't deserve any gifts. Amen? None. None. Zero. We deserve what all mankind actually deserves, which is to perish. But we're not. We're not. We have eternal life in Christ Jesus. And so from God's perspective, he says through this song of Mary, look, my mercy goes out from generation to generation. Mary, be merciful. Jeff, be merciful. Jeff, show them the grace of God. That's that proclamation to everyone. He wants to use the Christmas story to show the world his mercy. To show the world his grace. 
His forgiveness. That He is in fact good. That He loves us. That's why Mary's singing. That's why this hymn comes out the way it does. You see, God cares about those things. Like when you're sitting trying to eat breakfast and you're looking at the mass of humanity and your heart gets touched and broken, Jeff, what are you doing about it? Because I love them. This is not to bum you out, but we have an opportunity. This is that rare time of the year where you can just make people so angry when they say, Happy Holidays, you can say, Merry Christmas. Amen? Think about it. Why? Because I'm celebrating Christ. I don't know who this holiday dude is that you're celebrating, (laughs) but I'm celebrating Christ. It's a simple thing. And yet how often we we just kind of capitulate to the world. It's like, well, you know, I don't want to offend anybody. I'll guarantee you that the Lord in heaven has a big smile on his face when you retort with Merry Christmas. Blessed Christmas. Or even better yet, did you know that Jesus is the reason for this season? Amen? Amen. It's not that hard. It's six words. Make sure you're making a practical proclamation for everyone. And then finally, thirdly and lastly, notice in the final couple of verses in our passage there in verses 54 and 55, speaking of what God's still going to do for Israel, he has helped his servant Israel, in remembrance, notice this, of his mercy. The same mercy that he's poured out on everybody else, he also is pouring out on his own people, even though many of them had rejected him. This is so beautifully hopeful. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. The final verse of this song is focusing back in their day and time to a period when Abraham walked the earth 1,900 years earlier. And the Jewish people had repetitively said, that's not the Messiah, that's not the Messiah, we don't, want, we don't even know if the Messiah is actually going to come, but we're going to set a place at Passover for him anyway. And God still has mercy to be poured out on the Jewish people. Now, I don't know how many times you may have been in a relationship situation to where you were rejected as you have put forth your offer of love. You know, I don't know if you would go on for thousands of years being slapped in the face, but that is exactly what God has done. Why? Because he is forever good. He is forever merciful. He's forever gracious. He's forever kind. He's forever long-suffering. He is never not those things, including to people that reject him. And so the word here for Israel specifically is very clear, but it's also for your family that doesn't yet know Jesus, that maybe today is rejecting Jesus. Don't give up because God hasn't given up. Don't quit because God, by the Holy Spirit, has not quit on them. God is the keeper of his promises. And those promises to us are yes and amen. God loves you with an undying love. God will never leave you. He will not forsake you. He said, lo, I am with you even to the end of the age. Amen? He's not going to sell you short. 
not selling the Jewish people short. He still has a plan. And in a very personal way, this is a prophetic application for those in your life who don't know Jesus. God wants them to come to faith. But are you willing to sing about Jesus so that people can know about him? You see, that's what Mary's doing. Now, I don't know if she sang this hymn all the way back to Nazareth or not. I don't know. But I know from the way the scriptures describe her life, her life was very clearly about Jesus. Amen? And so for us in this season, for me in this season, I, I want to make sure that people know that God loves them. Know that God is for them. Know that God has a plan for them. That, that divine treaty that God signed with Israel was unconditional. And his promises to you as a child of God are also unconditional. If God said it, he intends to make it an absolute fact. Uh, and so as we kind of begin this next 10 days, of celebrating the birth of our Savior. Let's sing about Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand and we'll close in prayer. Well, the worship team's coming back out. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know we have a prayer team available in our prayer room. Maybe you came, you're carrying something with you, and you just need to pray with somebody. Perhaps you've never met Jesus, and you're saying... I want to know the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I just encourage you after, after service to go over and just say, I, I want to know more about Jesus. But as you think on this, we have an opportunity next Sunday, and I won't divulge any of the details to you, but you're going to want to be here, and you're going to want to bring people who don't know Jesus. And then one of those four performances of our musical play but I can tell you this, it's all about Jesus. And so take the time while people are thinking about it. You can talk to people about Jesus real easily right now. They may not like it, but it's on everybody's mind because they maybe they think you're weird. That's okay. Maybe they think you're one of those people. That's even better. Maybe they don't want to hear about Jesus. Tell them about him anyway. I mean, what's it going to cost you? Very little relative to the price that was paid to give you the opportunity to say it. Amen? So let's sing about Jesus. Anybody that will listen, just hum a song. Wander around, do, take those Christmas hymns that none of you sing any of the rest of the year and just hum those while you're going to work. <laughs> Father, thank you for the privilege of being able to proclaim your name and pray that we would be absolutely busy about our Father's business. Lord, as we celebrate your birth, preparing the way for what would be a life lived for 32 years that would culminate with your death on a cross. Lord, you, you didn't stop short Lord, you live your life to the fullest that we might have eternal life. You fulfilled those promises made through the Old Testament prophets. We pray that we would be faithful keepers of your gospel to this world. So, Father, bless us as we endeavor to share with people in our workplace and our homes and schools and, Lord, the businesses we own and frequent. Fathers, we're traveling. That gas station we stop in, could we just be a little bit of a voice for you singing a song that would lead people to the cross to salvation in you Jesus thank you Lord for blessing us fill us with your spirit and use us for your glory we ask in Jesus name Amen